We have a big morning ahead, and we are so glad you could all be with us here today. Thanks to those of you who, are join who have joined us in person and to those of you who are watching online. Before we get to today's program, we have some exciting news to share. Last week, we announced WIDA's, the WIDA Academy's first intensive trade seminar focused on the European Union. Over three days, attendees will learn the nuts and bolts of EU governance and trade policy making. This is uh, European equivalent to the session we do every year on the US government. We're gonna do this now on the EU, and that takes place May 10, 11, and 12 in the morning Eastern time. Information can be found at our website, www.wita.org. We have to make a few other announcements later, but, but before we do that, um, quick run through of what to expect this morning. First, we have our all-star panel to discuss the role of the WTO in a net zero future. Then we'll have a very short break and set the stage for our very special guest, the Director General of the WTO, Dr. Ngozi okonjo iweala who will give remarks and then sit down for an armchair discussion with Ambassador Demetrius Morantis. If you're watching this on Zoom, please use the Q&A tab, and we'll try to get to some of those questions later in the session. We'll also take questions from those of you who are here in the room. Everyone who is here today, whether watching in person or online, should have received an email with the biographies of today's speakers. You also have a QR code on your table. If you scan that on your phone, you can pull up the biographies so we can dispense with lengthy introductions. Before I turn this over to my good friend, Jake Colvin, I want to offer thanks to our partners here at the Ronald Reagan Building and International Trade Center and their new Vice President for International Programs, Allison Brown McKithen. Thank you, Allison, and the whole team here at TCMA for your help on this event and all of WIDA's signature events here at the World Trade Center DC. Also want to thank the Silverado Policy Accelerator, who sponsor all of WIDA's trade and climate events. To introduce our panel, and share thoughts on the importance of trade to addressing climate change, I'd like to welcome to the stage my good friend Jake Colvin, the president of the National Foreign Trade Council. Uh, well, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Ken. I really appreciate the chance to help kick off today's discussion. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with NFTC, uh, you know we're a business association that uh, seeks to advance global commerce uh, through leadership on international trade and tax policy. And way back in 2001, um, thanks to Mary Iris, uh, NFTC launched a working group dedicated to engaging in the WTO. And we've sought to be a leading voice of business uh, in Geneva ever since. Now, the world has changed a lot in the, in the uh, past 20 years, but the WTO continues to provide a critical baseline of rules to govern the global economy, as well as the promise that those rules will be enforced. At its best, you know, the WTO can also be a vibrant platform to explore new issues and respond to pressing challenges. Now, during the pandemic, Dr. Uela's leader, uh, under Dr. Okonjo-Uela's leadership, the WTO's work to improve trade facilitation showed that it could serve as a nimble and responsive platform to respond to urgent challenges. We also see the, WTO as, uh, the promise of the WTO as a platform to create new rules and facilitate e-commerce and create more inclusive access to the global marketplace. Today, before we hear from Dr. Conjuela, we has assembled an outstanding group to discuss the role of the WTO in tackling climate and trade policy. Uh, now, this is an area where leadership under the WTO umbrella will be essential to ensure that we leverage trade policy to meet shared climate goals. But I think it's also essential to guard against ideological efforts to undermine the global trading system or weaken IP rules under a veneer of climate action. We're privileged to be joined by a group of experts and officials with deep expertise on trade and climate who are going to unpack the role of the WTO in a net zero future. Uh, Angela Allard is the Deputy Director of the World Trade Organization, and she was also involved in trade and environment issues when she served as Chief Trade Counsel for the Ways and Means Committee. Kelly Milton serves as the Assistant U.S. Trade Representative for Environment and Natural Resources. And before that, NFTC uh, had the privilege of calling on her when she was an attache to the U.S. mission in Geneva. Jennifer Hillman is a professor with the Georgetown Law Center and a former member of the WTO appellate body. And she was asking who's afraid of the WTO when considering the trade implications of carbon taxes way back in 2013. Linda Dempsey is vice president of public affairs for CF Industries. And NFTC had the chance to partner with her and her colleagues in support uh, of an environmental goods agreement when she served as NAM's vice president for international economic affairs. Maureen Hinman is our moderator for the discussion. Maureen's the co-founder and chairman of the Silverado Policy Accelerator, 
And we had the chance to work with her when she served as Director for Environment and Natural Resources at USTR, and earlier when she was an Environmental Technology Trade Specialist with the Department of Commerce. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Maureen, over to you. Jake, thank you so much. Um, and I wanted to thank WIDA for having us here today. And I also wanted to um, apologize for the lack of gender diversity on our panel today. Um, <laughs> We'll do better next time. Um, it's truly an honor, though, to be with this esteemed panel of true experts in the, in the space of environment and climate. Um, and with the uh, with April 22nd, which is Earth Day, just around the corner, I think the timing is fantastic. Um, we have a lot to cover, and, and I, I know everyone doesn't want to hear it from me more than they want to hear from our esteemed panel. So uh, let's get started. <clears throat> Deputy Director General Allard, Angela, if I may. Please. It's wonderful to have you back in Washington. Um, I know everyone's really happy to have you in Geneva. Uh, the WTO has had uh, a lot of uh, uh, ambitious work it's been doing lately on climate, uh, cooperation with the UNFCCC, um, steel and decarbon steel decarbonization dialogues, uh, research and publications, the work in the test D. It's a really full agenda. Can you elaborate on the various initiatives uh, at the WTO and how you think the role of the organization uh, is going to help advance climate outcomes. Well, thanks, Maureen, and, and thanks to WIDA, to Ken. Um, always such a great pleasure to be here, and of course, with uh, colleagues from way, way, way back. Um, that is a very meaty question that, that you have asked, so let me, let me dig into it, but also uh, try to be uh, concise. The WTO is doing an incredible amount of work right now um, concerning environment. And, and I think we busted the myth that, several myths, one that uh, trade and environment don't mix, another that the WTO can't do environment, um, and another that WTO rules prevent us from doing environment, another that we can't get consensus on doing anything on environment, as you all uh, no, the WTO operates by consensus, which means everything we do has to be agreed upon by 164 members. So let me just give you an example. Uh, back in June last year, the WTO um, ministers met and agreed on a very ambitious and binding agreement prohibiting certain types of uh, harmful fisheries subsidies. So that may not be directly climate, but it does show that the WTO can work on issues of sustainability and can reach consensus on those issues. It was the first binding multilateral agreement ever reached in this space, meeting uh, UN SDG goal 14.6. Um, so it was a tremendous accomplishment to get that kind of consensus. And I'll let Kelly share certain news that I, I won't jump the gun on that. Um, but um, I think that uh, that really shows that we can do this, that we have the wherewithal. And the interesting thing about it to me is that a few years ago, it would have been impossible, I think, to do anything on environment in the WTO. We just couldn't reach consensus. And now we've reached the situation where it's almost because this was an agreement on sustainability, that there was such a drive to reach that consensus and such a, a, a pull. So now we're, we're doing a whole bunch of other things. Um, you mentioned the testee, the um, structured uh, sustainability discussions that we have ongoing that involves um, uh, just under half of our members. We're also doing uh, work on plastics pollution and that also involves just under half of our members. We also are doing work with respect to uh, fuel subsidies. Um, and that, that is, I, I think, a growing area of interest by uh, many of our members. We're hosting all kinds of work at the WTO. A couple of weeks ago, we did an event on steel decarbonization. Um, and that involves stakeholders as well as uh, representatives from our various members. Um, and I think the, the interest in this area is amazing, given that that sector accounts for about 7% of emissions. It's really important to, to have some kind of understanding. Um, so our role is to create a forum 
a forum in particular in which everyone's at the table, 164 members, big, small, develop, developing, different forms of government, to get them all to the table to work on issues relating to mitigation, adaptation, transparency, um, avoiding fragmentation, trying to pull everyone together to share best practices in different areas. And I think it really is resonating. And we're also hoping to do an agreement on environmental goods. I, you know, the members have to decide that they want to do this. But if we were to have an agreement cutting tariffs on environmental goods, that would increase trade in these products by 5% and decrease emissions by 0.6%. And I'm glad to see there's increasing congressional support here in the US for that. But I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, you said EGA, which is very close to my heart, and there are other former EGA colleagues in the in the um, in the audience as well. But uh, not to jump the gun, I'd love to turn to Kelly now, who uh, knows how well uh, trade and environment mix, because you have spent many years working at the intersection of trade and environment, both at USTR and at the State Department. Um, and now. Uh, the U.S. has its own pretty ambitious agenda on trade and environment right now from the U.S.-EU bilateral discussions uh, for the Global Arrangement on Sustainable Steel and Aluminum, or GASA, if you will. Um, the work that you're doing with the, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework negotiations, plus the test D uh, at the WTO. Uh, my question for you is, what are the specific climate objectives that, are, that, 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 that the U.S. is seeking in, the, in these initiatives, both direct and indirect? Um, and do you feel that these, uh, these, these initiatives have uh, the, the potential to serve as building blocks of the WTO? Okay. Well, thank you, Maureen, and, and thank you to WIDA for this event, and, and really, really great to see people in person and to do, do an in-person event after so many Zoom panels. So, so thank you for being here today. So um, really, I mean, fighting the climate crisis will require every tool in our toolbox, as we say, and trade is certainly a part of that toolbox. Um, just to, to your specific question about you know, overarching objectives or specific climate objectives that we're seeking in our various initiatives that we're undertaking, really what we're looking for is, in essence, enabling both ourselves and our trading partners to reach the objective of net zero and to really do so and look to trade-related mechanisms and engagements um, in a, and to do so in a complementary way. So you mentioned the global arrangement. You also mentioned IPEF. Maybe I'll touch on both, both of those briefly, but I wanted to certainly focus in on, on the WTO. Um, so in the global arrangement uh, for uh, sustainable steel and aluminum, what we have been saying from the beginning is that we're really looking to uh, create a new trade paradigm one that really addresses two fundamental issues, which is that around carbon intensity as well as you know, non-market excess capacity. And you know, really looking to incentivize decarbonization through a market-based approach in these very energy intensive sectors. Uh, when it comes to the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, we're pursuing um, really a set of environmental provisions that we think will contribute to um, improving environmental protections as well as addressing common sustainability challenges like climate change. Uh, we have recently put forward a text that in fact tries to break new ground in areas that we haven't in fact um, previously touched on in a trade framework. So for instance, climate and trade, uh, digital economy and environmental sustainability, uh, resource um, efficiency and circularity, uh, renewable energy, sustainable finance. Um, beyond that, we're also, of course, pursuing our traditional uh, provisions around natural resource management, combating illegal logging and associated trade, really aiming to ensure that we're trading in legally sourced products um, because, of course, you know, as we preserve biodiversity and the ecosystems on which our economies depend, we create adaptation opportunities in the face of climate change. So I want to just turn to the discussions that we're having at the WTO really briefly and just mention that I completely agree with Angela that we have, in fact, you know, busted the myth that trade and environment are not mutually supportive. We absolutely believe that they are. And what has basically happened um, in the 
recent months, recent years, is we've really made a lot of progress within the WTO on trade and environment issues. You know, in the not so distant past, we actually faced some challenges to bring some of these really important issues into, for instance, the Committee on Trade and Environment to have discussions among members on these issues. But the test D, for instance, has really provided an opportunity to have the informal and frank discussions among members to kind of lower the temperature on measures that you know, WTO members are taking in this space and to really have an opportunity to talk through these very important uh, trade-related environment issues. Just briefly, for example, let me just touch really quickly on the, the circular economy issues. So, you know, for instance, you know, in the circular economy work stream that we're talking about through the test D, we're, we're talking about like where and how circular economy approaches can be incorporated <coughs> into the trading system. It's really key to understanding the role that trade can play to enable more circularity. So whether it's back to reuse, remanufacturing, recycling, other productive processes to keep the goods and materials in the economy for as long as possible, trade has a role to play for any given product or good. And it's really critical as we transition to a net zero future because we have to be thinking about how the materials that we're using that are already mined, that are already in products, like how we can actually keep them in the productive use for as long as possible. So this is just one example of how you know, trade plays a really important role and how the WTO is playing a really important role for members to have these conversations. I don't want to monopolize too much time, but you asked specifically about you know, building blocks for, for future agreements you know, in the WTO. I think others may speak to that issue, but I did want to say that you know, we already have a lot of tools available at the WTO, whether it's in these environment work streams that we've already mentioned, or whether it's in, you know, for instance, the TBT agreement, the trade facilitation agreement, the government procurement agreement. There are already uh, sustainability work streams that are, are happening in those agreements. Um, more can certainly be done to basically look to the current organizational structure and how we can bring environment in kind of across, across the board, not just in the environment work streams. So rather than, I think, necessarily looking for the next thing to negotiate, it's really important that we use the powerful tools that we already have at our disposal and really you know, have those conversations about implementing existing agreements, having transparency in how we do so, um, really having those conversations is quite important too. Thanks. Great, and that's a great segue. But before we move on from you, Kelly, is there anything you'd like to tell the audience? I want to congratulate you. Well, I think everybody's probably, hopefully everybody's already seen. Um, the United States submitted our acceptance um, of the, the new uh, WTO agreement on fishery subsidies that um, Angela mentioned was agreed at MC12. So we're really, we're really thrilled to take that very important step. Our, our work continues on the negotiations, on obviously implementation of the agreement, on entry into force of the agreement, but we couldn't be more thrilled. So thank Congratulations. you. Thank you. Jennifer. Uh, Kelly mentioned that the, the WTO's role in smoothing out potential conflicts is critical and that um, staying true to existing disciplines is important. Uh, nonetheless, there's a lot of consternation around investments in, in decarbonization and uh, uh, those investments appearing as being green subsidies. Uh, from your, from your, your perch, do you think that we need a green box uh, for these types of, for decarbonization subsidies, or do you think that we need a full, something more like a full traffic light? Let me just first of all say thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. And I'll start by saying there definitely is clearly a role for the WTO to play, and I would certainly echo on everyone else. I mean, we simply are not going to move far enough and fast enough in fighting climate change unless we use the trade tools that are in the toolbox. And the second thing I'll say is I think there is already um, a lot of flexibility. I mean, I would certainly agree with Kelly. There, the good news is the existing rules um, allow countries to take a whole variety of measures. Can you impose a, a carbon border adjustment consistently with your WTO obligations? Yes. Can you try to think about new ways of looking at subsidies consistent with your WTO? Agreements, yes. Can you think about imposing um, labeling requirements so you have to disclose the carbon content of goods coming in consistently with your WTO obligations? Yes. And yet, when you look at what's happening, 
you see, you know, the European Union, and I think increasingly maybe Canada, going down the road of putting on carbon taxes effectively and a carbon border adjustment. And you see over here on the United States side, um, instead a shunning of that approach and instead looking at subsidies um, and, and trying to address carbon, uh, climate change through subsidies. So there's clearly clashes coming. And, and I think you see this clash really directly in, in the fact that included within the um, Inflation Reduction Act and the provisions on electric vehicles, in addition to all of the good that it would do to encourage every American to shift to driving an electric vehicle, you see this attachment of requirements for local content. You know, that the only electric vehicles that qualify for the tax credit are those that are assembled in North America. And they have to have critical minerals and batteries that have um, production or processing in the United States or in a free trade agreement country. So you already start to see, if you will, the potential for that clash coming. So here is where I do think the WTO has a really important role to play, which is to help shape the where and the how do you draw the line between a genuine climate change measure and between a protectionist measure? And that, to me, is where we need to see, you know, again, some, and, and, and to me, the good news is that the WTO already has a number of tools at its disposal to help in that line drawing. Some of it does not, it does not all need to be done through the dispute settlement system. But I will just say, the dispute settlement system is still there notwithstanding the fact that we don't have an appellate body, we still have panels that are meeting and hearing cases and can help at least say, in this instance, this is where we see that line being drawn. But there are many other tools also at the WTO, whether that's in the committees, whether that's in this test D dialogue, whether that's in the raising within every committee of the WTO is this ability to raise what is referred to as a special trade concern, an STC. So the WTO has a panoply of tools to do what I think is going to be one of its critical roles in this space, which is, again, to just help shape where we draw that line between what is a protectionist measure versus what is a climate change measure, and, and sort of which things that are, have a mixed purpose, where do they fall within that panoply. And I, and I think the WTO is well equipped um, to start playing exactly that role. I agree. I think the... Um we always have to remember that the point of the international trade system is not harmonization of national measures, but interoperability to facilitate commerce. And in this case, also uh, commerce for, clim for, for climate. Um, Linda, that's a good segue, moving on to you. As a private sector representative uh, from energy intensive and highly traded industry, but at a company that is dedicated to carbonization, um, I'd love to hear from you on how you, you view the trading, the trading system's impact on your, your, your effort to decarbonize and uh, what specific sort of national programs such as the, the IRA or the bi bipartisan infrastructure law you think um, uh, are, are contributing to that and whether they're sufficient or not. Great. Well, thank you. And thank, uh, thank you, Ken, and everyone at WIDA. It's great to be back with all of you again. Uh, it's, been, it's been a few years as I've taken on this new role. From the vantage point of CF Industries, which is a global leader in the production of ammonia, nitrogen fertilizer, NOx abatement uh, products like diesel exhaust fluid that is, as Maureen said, committed to decarbonize, we view trade as an absolutely essential tool to help reduce global emissions and really accelerate the clean energy transition that we all know has to take place. You know, Angela, the whole panel has really talked about the ways that the WTO and trade can be an engine for this decarbonization. Let me give you a real life example about how important the trading system is and trade is to what we're talking about. Um, the International Energy Agency estimates that by 2030, uh, there will be, uh, in terms of coal power generation, six gigatons of CO2 emissions emitted annually. That's about 16% of 2021 emissions. Huge. Japan, in particular, is leading the way to say, we want to decarbonize. We have a lot of these coal power 
electricity power generation facilities. We're developing, we've developed the roadmap, we've developed the regulations. We're going to use ammonia to co-fire 20% of that. If the rest of the world that uses this coal can also do that, we're talking about a 20% drop in emissions, 1.2 gigatons of emissions annually that would not be emitted. Japan's not a big ammonia producer, clean ammonia producer, nor are many of these other countries. So trade has to develop to promote this type of, of movement. And if you have new technologies, you might be able to increase that amount of ammonia use and reduce the amount of coal. So this is very important, very important, and can have monumental impacts. Uh, we, you know, obviously other industries as well. The challenge, sitting where we sit as a emissions intensive industry, like my friends in metals and, and cement and, and others, is these are commodity products sold today largely on the basis of really small price differentials. The environmental attributes are not really being considered. We're working and investing hundreds of millions of dollars to decarbonize existing facility, to have the first largest new green ammonia using renewable electricity and electrolyzers uh, here in the United States by the end of the year. It takes a lot of investment. We're looking at uh, billions of dollars in, in investment in a new green field across the carbon intensive industries, we're talking trillions upon trillions of dollars in the United States and globally. How do you make those investments in the, in the trade world that we have today when those investments are gonna last for 20, 30, 40 plus years? The national policies we've seen, certainly the United States, the Inflation Reduction Act, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, these are game changing. They're really helping to accelerate the movement and the ability to invest in a lot of industries here in the United States. But they're all time limited, right? They're nowhere near the type of horizon that industries like ours need to consider when we're putting new facilities on the ground. So that's where I think the trading system, and I can get into this later, can help us develop uh, through collaboration, through promoting trade in clean products, uh, really help drive some of that certainty that national governments can't alone. Europe, obviously, Canada, the UK, many other governments have taken you know, significant actions to support industry and decarbonization. Many are updating those actions because of what the United States was able to do with the Inflation Reduction Act in particular. But that alone doesn't create a consistency or coherence, and that alone doesn't give the level of certainty that I think the industries that are really trying to decarbonize and using their own dollars to do so uh, need to see for the long term. Excellent. Thank you. Well, now I think we'll move into a lightning round of questions before we uh, turn to the audience. Um, I wanted to begin with, with you, Angela. Um, uh, just maybe just a, a quick uh, view of where you think that the uh, climate uh, work at the WTO is going to be going in the next couple of years, uh, bearing in mind that climate is unique in that, uh, unlike other trade challenges, climate has, is very time bound. We don't have a ton of time to solve the problem. Lightning question, harder answer. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I guess what I would say is that we don't have very much time, and that creates, I think, a certain degree of urgency among our members in the WTO. And we can really see this. I mean, we saw it in fish, where we saw global fish stocks now, uh, that when those negotiations began about 20 years ago, um, we were seeing a decrease by about maybe 25, 30%. Now, by some measures, the reduction in fish, the, the, the number of fish stocks that are overfished is above 50%. And the trend is greatly accelerating. So very comparable in terms of intensity and urgency to what we're seeing uh, with respect to climate. 
And that really pulled members together, this, this sense that for developed countries and developing countries alike, even though they're looking at the situation from different perspectives, there is a sense of the global commons and a sense of the need to, uh, to act quickly. So I think what we're seeing in FISH with respect to the first wave, and congratulations to the US, um, and, and now with subsequent negotiations, we will um, see more and more of that. Now, all of these other areas where, uh, where we've, all, we've all mentioned um, so many of them, um, where the WTO is, is working, we need to be able to harness that energy and, and to be able to help it deliver results. So whether it's agreements or certain types of, of rules in particular situations, like the Environmental Goods Agreement, um, whether it's creating a forum for these discussions about, as you correctly put it, the question of interoper interoperability and trying to get um, uh, a sense of how different systems can work together. Ultimately, also from the business perspective, trying to create as much certainty and transparency as possible and to use our institutions within the WTO as an opportunity to have that dialogue, whether it is specific to particular sectors or whether it's, it's broader. Uh, so um, it, it can really run the gamut and we can do many different things at one time. Um, and then when, it's, uh, when it comes to uh, the question of different ways of approaching the problem that members may take, whether it's the US and the Inflation Reduction Act or the EU and CBAM or other types of approaches. Um, there, there is a lot of work that needs to be done within the Committee on Trade and Environment perhaps, but, but more broadly in the context of WTO reform to try to reach an understanding of how these rules would work. The WTO doesn't prevent, as Jennifer said, does not prevent governments from taking steps, but the questions are, relate to whether they are compatible with WTO rules. Of course, we want to avoid litigation. Working on climate via litigation is the worst way to come up with any kind of consistent or, or coherent, I guess I should say, coherent uh, approach to climate. It's just going to be confusing. It's, it's going to be overly political. So trying to address some of the concerns, having members talk to each other, I think is really important. And we're seeing more of that. And at the same time, we need to expand the number of members who are engaged in test D, discussions on circular economy, um, the discussions on um, uh, all the, uh, the plastics pollution, all of these things that we're doing create a lot of opportunities. We have all of these different work streams, some more controversial perhaps than others, but it's a great moment for us, I think, to all come together with different views, but to all come together uh, with a common sense of, of purpose. Excellent, thank you. Kelly, quickly, um, what do you, you have had your hands in literally every trade and environment and climate issue. Um, from your perspective, what do you think is the, has the most potential for convergence and what do you believe is the role of the WTO in achieving that, that convergence? So I think, thank you, Maureen, and, and I think, you know, I'd also like to look at your question from the lens of, like, what are the challenges that we're facing? And I think this really builds um, and is quite complementary to what, what Angela was just noting. I mean, basically, I see a couple of, of, of really important challenges that we need to keep in mind when we're trying to find convergence. So the first challenge, really, is that, you know, the concept of maintaining and also increasing our climate ambition. So we have talked about the urgency. It's, you know, we, there really is an urgency to tackle the climate crisis. The science makes that clear. And, you know, to do that, we have to really address the fact that the climate needs to remain a top priority of each of our governments, that we need to leverage the various tools that we have um, and that really look at it as a potential opportunity 
to, to advance um, our respective climate goals. But we also you know, need to kind of keep climate as a priority when we're having a lot of other challenges that we're facing. So you know, when we're simultaneously navigating supply chain challenges, geopolitical tensions, other urgent demands, we have to recognize that we, we can't let go of the importance of, of acting to address climate and you know, not have that be um, overtaken by other important and, and sometimes competing demands. But secondly, I think, and this speaks a little bit to what Angela was also just noting, you know, we may be tempted to look for one-size-fits-all solutions. And that's another challenge, that we need to actually recognize the reality um, that the world is complex, that we, that we take different approaches to addressing a common objective, and that's OK. And so you know, that kind of speaks to how can we find convergence and how can we look to the WTO to help us do that. So where, where I really see um, the, the WTO kind of lending a hand and, and helping us accelerate our efforts is in the information sharing potential, uh, the transparent uh, and inclusive processes, and really consistent messaging to policymakers um, and really to the global market that we need to, to tackle these challenges head on. So for example, you know, the WTO is really well placed to reinforce the messaging that our climate efforts are not in contravention to the trading system, um, and, but rather that we must be ambitious. And you know, we have for decades, as we were talking about in the earlier uh, question and answer segment, about the fact that there is a recognition of the mutual supportiveness of trade and environment. And nowhere is that more clear or more important than in basically taking our respective efforts to tackle climate change. So you know, we really feel that the WTO can serve as a platform from which we can share and where possible coordinate uh, potential actions and really serve as a platform to find new opportunities for trade to contribute to those efforts and to not create potential barriers. And really the convening power that the WTO has to bring members together to talk about these uh, really difficult issues because the conversations, the information sharing, the proper implementation of the commitments that we already have, this is, this is really important to, you know, in and of itself. Couldn't agree more. Jennifer, you used to serve on the appellate body and are a, a well-known legal guru uh, uh, on WTO law. Just this question about uh, whether we need the existing rules are sufficient, or do we need do we need new disciplines for drawdown? So I'll just start by saying uh, I think the needle's moved a long way from the notion that the WTO rules are standing in the way, are a barrier to countries doing something um, in the climate change space. I think there's now pretty wide acceptance that the current tools allow a lot of flexibility for countries to move. So I don't think the rules need to be changed, but I think they should be. Um, I, I think new agreements would be preferable because they would allow countries to move a lot farther and a lot faster. I could imagine, for example, a new agreement on renewable energy that could focus on putting together a package of all of the goods and all of the services and all of the in, uh, technology transfer things that you need to do to really move in the way that you could allow that renewable energy to move kind of as a package. In other words, a mini environmental goods and services agreement that would really focus on, on all of the goods, technology, human capital development that it takes to install wind, solar, et cetera. I could imagine a new agreement related to subsidies. And I think the fisheries agreement is a really good example. If you think about what happened in that fisheries agreement, what happened was countries agreed that these three categories of fisheries subsidies would now be added to the list of prohibited subsidies, of subsidies that everybody agrees we will no longer grant or maintain subsidies on these particular items. I could imagine a new agreement where we come to some understandings about certain subsidies in the fossil fuel area or in the most climate damaging area where we would do exactly what we did in the fisheries agreement, which is to agree that this category of subsidies now falls into that category of countries agree they shall not grant or maintain those subsidies. More ambitious but not impossible would be, again, a new development in the subsidies area that would reinstate the notion of subsidies that are not challengeable. I mean, whether we could come up with a clear agreement on green subsidies, um, those that are actually affirmatively promoting, again, both 
the, the development of the technology, the transfer of the technology, and the support of green technologies, and we would all agree that those would be in a category that would not be challengeable and would not be subject to countervailing duties. Um, perhaps I think the most critical would be to a, an agreement that would help address the issue of technology transfer. Um, if we're going to solve climate change, it is really clear that all of these technologies that Linda is talking about, all of the work that so many companies are doing out there to develop clean technologies, we've got to get it out there and adopted and adapted across the globe fast. Um, and so to me, the other place where you know, a new agreement or at least some new understandings would be, how do we remove all of the current barriers um, to the idea of moving technology out far and fast? whether that requires looking at something like, um, I, I don't wanna say a waiver, but a something like where are we with respect to the intellectual property agreements and where are we with the barriers to the services that go along with technology transfer, which really means human capital development. But we could imagine an agreement that would really move the needle on a broad array of, of a fast lane, if you will, for technology transfer in the climate change area. So there's a lot of potential for new agreements um, and, and they don't have to be. I mean, the good news for me is you've seen these joint structural initiatives and others say that yes, you can, uh, you can reach agreements with less than all of the members of the WTO and you could do it through some kind of a joint structured initiative kind of a process. So there's huge promise and opportunities. Is it essential? No, because the current tools are not standing in the way. Would it be better? Yes. Excellent, thank you. Well, that's a good segue to, to Linda. Um, what do you think in, are the areas that are most important for the WTO to focus on in this regard? So I'm going to pick up on a few things that, that Kelly in particular said, but I, I've got three buckets of ideas here. One is information and data. Second is collaboration and convening. And third is the promotion of trade in, in clean products. On information sharing, I think we've all talked about it, is absolutely critical. One of the areas I come to is data. Right? We know from work that the Climate Leadership Council has done that a lot of US manufacturing is less carbon intensive than manufacturing in many other parts of the world with the exception of you know, Canada, uh, Western Europe, a few other places. And so there's all this carbon leakage that's going on in terms of a lot of this commodity trade. How do we help, how could the WTO help build more knowledge. Because if policymakers, if businesses, if all stakeholders don't understand what's really happening in the world of carbon and GHG today, how can you make the right decisions going forward? And so I think that's really important. At the same time, I'll say it's really difficult. Right? I don't see the WTO as coming up with uh, a definition of what clean ammonia is or how do you define that. This is really hard stuff. Life, you know, looking at it for, for the products we make, it is really hard to understand and you need those environmental engineers and that life cycle analysis. And that's where I think the WTO could rely on its most ambitious members and identifying those industries and really try to work to develop some of that, that learning. But I think that is an important tool. Obviously, collaboration and convening, everybody else has talked about it as well. Let me bring in the concept of industry. We produce fertilizer that helps our farmers feed the world, right? We're going to decarbonize that production. We're going to help decarbonize a part of the agricultural sector. That's great. But the food and agricultural sector is a huge, massive sector, right? How can the WTO work? Because we don't want to make, we want to make sure that the whole sector is moving in the right way. And you know, farmers aren't laid on with additional costs that they don't need to bear. How can we help drive that? And I think that's where convening, collaboration, working with the World Food Organization, other organizations out there will be really Im important. The same thing is obviously true in the energy sector. Let me end on how do you promote trade in, in clean energy? I, I worked on the environmental goods agreement in, in a past life. I think it was a great idea. I'm disappointed that it didn't move forward. Today, I will say it's not enough. It's not broad enough. We need to get at 
you know, a whole host of lower carbon, zero carbon products out there if we're really going to promote the type of transition that industry is, is really trying to drive, at least in some parts of the world. Um, the other piece, obviously, is the price on carbon. In a perfect world, the WTO, the, the, all the world would have come together on this. At the moment, we're seeing Europe with their, their border carbon adjustment mechanism. In the US, there's Democratic proposals. There's going to be Republican proposals on uh, carbon border taxes. How do you develop that in a way that works throughout let's say the food and agricultural sector, but how do you do it in a way that creates that certainty? Because ultimately a price on carbon really is what could help drive the full decarbonization of, of the world that we need. Um, but that's going to take some time. And so again, I, I turn back to the work done in collaborating with the G7 and their climate club and others to share information and help drive that. And finally, I would just say, I think it's also important that, that things aren't done that would slow down private investment. So the investment I'm talking about that, that we, many of our peers are making, what Japan is doing, right? There's a lot of you know, industry-wide certification programs going on. That's something the WTO should re respect and support and not try to supplant, right? And help to make sure that those things go forward. Ultimately, there may be other rules, other standards that are developed, but at the moment, there's some of these areas where industry is leading and we shouldn't slow that down. Excellent, thank you. Well, I'd love to move to the audience now. You can go ahead and raise your, oh, perfect. Thank you. Um, Kelly Myman with McClarty Associates. Um, Jennifer, I, I'm gonna follow up. Oh, thank you, sorry. Kelly Myman with McClarty Associates, thank you. Jennifer, I thought I'd follow up on the three ideas that you put out there, which as usual, are really thought-provoking. Um, if we were to do an agreement, um, like a mini subsidies agreement, and look at allowing those sorts of subsidies for, for green goods, whatever we ended up defining those as, how would that comport with some of the items and inputs that go into clean energy items that aren't terribly clean, right? I'm thinking about battery inputs and this and that. How would you see being able to thread that needle in that scenario? Thanks. So again, I, I think the, the, the concept is, uh, I think, to go back to, to some degree where, where the subsidies agreement started out, having a category of subsidies that were in this list of not actionable. Okay, and that was, those provisions died away after five years, but the idea is to sort of bring them back. So the idea is not that you wouldn't still have to disclose them. The idea would be you would, you would clearly have to work out, you know, kind of what would fall into what parameter, but the, the concept would be, in essence, everybody agrees that subsidies that fall into this category, and here's again where I think the, the WTO has great tools. The WTO, right, the WTO right now requires notifications of subsidies. So one of the things the WTO could do is to help to say, when you're notifying your subsidies, think about putting in as a separate notification or as an additional notification, subsidies that you believe fall into this category of green. I mean, that they are leading to the promotion of climate reducing or other green res results. Separately notify them or, or again, it, it, provide, again, information, transparency about what you're doing. And then the hope would be that there could be some kind of a general agreement um, the, the subsidies that were notified as green would be transparently available to everybody to know about, but would not be challengeable. I mean, that you would not file cases against them and you would not bring countervailing duty actions against them. That's the concept. The details of exactly what would fit into it, I think, would have to be worked out. And again, that's one of those dialogues um, that could easily happen, but, but that would have to be, the notion is that if it is going to lead to, and again, the, the good news is I think there's a lot of agreement about what should generally fit into this box. Um, so I think it could be something agreed to relatively, relatively early on, but the idea would be those subsidies that relate to, again, the research, the development, and the production of goods that help move the needle on climate change would be notified and would be, in essence, agreed as off limits. Thank you. Thank 
Good morning, ladies. Brenda Smith with Expeditors International. Um, you've highlighted, several of you, the need for harmonization, predictability, and a sense of urgency. And several of you have also talked about uh, sectoral organizations and other international organizations. I work a lot with the World Customs Organization, and I know that there is a real desire to be part of the solution. What, from your perspective, could the WTO do to um, more actively align those organizations to, to um, carry out the urgency, the harmonization, and the predictability that the private sector is looking for? Angela, did you want to take that? <laughs> sure. I, I think that's a great question because in the trade space, the WTO obviously has a lot to offer. But we're not the only actor. And there are so many inter international organizations that we can partner with. And in fact, we do um, on, on these issues. So for example, the OECD, the World Bank, the IMF, just to name a few, the World Customs Organization, I think there's a lot of potential for us to uh, work with the WCO on, on all kinds of issues relating to um, uh, barriers to trade, tariff barriers, on uh, issues of nomenclature that really could be quite significant. Another reason why it's so important to bring international organizations as a whole into the mix is because of the role of development, which is something I think we really need to talk about because climate change is not just an industrialized world problem. It's a problem in which everyone is going to have to contribute, but it's also a problem in which many developing countries are the ones who are suffering the most. So that, I think, creates an imperative for action by international organizations in the trade space, the WTO, but there's no monopoly. We're not claiming a monopoly here. Um, and I think there's a lot of work to be done to make sure that we appreciate the particular problems that developing countries are facing so that the solutions that we come up with, whether it's some of the ideas that Jennifer has described or some US ideas or from the business perspective, some of the things that, that uh, Linda has suggested, we have to look at it not just from the perspective of one country, but broadly uh, across our membership. And I think one, one issue in particular that we might focus on um, that transcends works across all kinds of different systems and approaches to deal with climate change is the question of carbon pricing and the multiplicity of carbon pricing, of pri carbon prices across sectors, across uh, countries that's created this cacophony of approach. So international organizations, I think, have a lot to offer. And we will continue to, to partner with, uh, with the ones that I've mentioned. Thanks for the question, Brenda. Well, thank you. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting the, the hook right now from Ken. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a fascinating discussion. And thank you for saying nomenclature, because it's my favorite square on the trade bingo card. <laughs> um, but. Very fascinating team. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll, we'll look forward to our fireside chat in a few minutes with uh, Director Gen General Kanjo Wela. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us here today. Uh, before I introduce our keynote speaker, I want to offer a word of thanks to all of you who have helped make the launch of the WIDA Academy such a success. In December, we hosted our first capacity building seminar in advance of the Africa Leaders Summit here in Washington, DC. We hosted trade officials from 34 different African countries who logged into our online mini intensive trade seminar to learn how trade and aid policy are managed here in the US. And through our Pathways to Opportunity program, we are working with nearly a dozen different universities to host programs to introduce students to careers in international trade, including students from Howard University and the University of Maryland, some of whom are here with us today. And thanks to the generous support of our Academy sponsors, UPS and the Christina Bach Yeider Charitable Trust. 
all our outreach to the universities has been initiated by WIDA members. And we encourage you to help make our own community of trade professionals more diverse and inclusive by introducing us to schools that might benefit from WIDA Academy programming. Please reach out to my colleague, Diego Añez, the Executive Director of the WIDA Academy, for more information about all our Academy initiatives. It's now my great pleasure and sincere honor to welcome to WIDA someone who I first met three years ago. You may recall that in the summer of 2020, when we were all in a hard lockdown from the pandemic, WIDA hosted all of the candidates to be Director General of the WTO on our webinar platform. Dr. Okonja Iwela made an incredible first impression on all of us who first met her then. Her appearance has the most likes on our YouTube page <laughs> and was by far the most watched webinar of all the candidates we hosted. Maybe an early sign of strength of your candidacy. <laughs> Dr. Okonja Iwela came to the World Bank with an impeccable record, having spent 25 years at the World Bank where she first learned the power of trade to lift people out of poverty. She is a graduate of Harvard University and served as the Minister of Foreign Affairs and twice as the Minister of Finance in her native Nigeria. She is also, of course, the first woman and the first African leader of the World Trade Organization. Following her remarks, Dr. Okonji Iwela will sit down for an armchair discussion with my dear friend and a former WIDA board member, Ambassador Demetrius Morantis, Global Head of Corporate Responsibility at J.P. Morgan Chase. Dr. Okonji Iwela, it's truly an honor to welcome you and thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ken. I wish you'd told me this news about the most uh, watched on, you on YouTube so I could go there. I didn't know that. And uh, reassure myself on those days that when the going is tough. So it's really a great pleasure uh, to be back with you in WITA. And I want to thank you for hosting me during my candidacy and giving a chance to you know, exchange views with the community that is most respected in trade, the community of WITA. Um, I'm also looking forward to the conversation with Dimitris. I saw him, yeah, there you are. Um, later on in the program, you have to bear with me. I, I'm told I have 15 minutes uh, to make my remarks. Now, I didn't catch the end of this morning's panel with Angela, my, one of my wonderful deputy directors general. Um, so I was hoping to catch it, but I hope that whatever happens, that one of your takeaways from that is that trade and the WTO are indispensable tools for getting to net zero for getting there faster and at lower cost. Because climate change is just one of the big challenges we now confront where trade is part of the solution. Growth and development, food security, pandemic preparedness, socioeconomic inclusion, even peace and security on all these fronts, trade and cooperation at the WTO can help countries better meet people's needs and aspirations. So in my remarks today, I will look at some of these connections. I will look at how global trade is evolving, the risks, as well as the considerable opportunities. And I'll make the case that the WTO's 13th Ministerial Conference next February is a chance for members, for governments to reinforce the multilateral trading system, for the business community to do so, for civil society to do so and uh, a chance to reinforce this multilateral trading system and to capture some of the opportunities which are out there. Let me say at the outset that I don't want geopolitics to become the elephant in the room, so I'll address it at the outset. We know that strategic competition is a reality of the world we live in. We cannot wish it away. At the same time, in spite of the tense atmosphere we are in, we know we need strategic cooperation on climate change and in other areas, or else the world will become unlivable. That too is an inescapable truth, and I'll come back to this issue of geopolitics later. One reason the success of the WTO's ministerial meeting last June was so significant is that the agreements reached there provided proof that we can get cooperation alongside competition. 
all 164 WTO members, Russia, Ukraine, China, the US, EU, etc., developing and developed countries, signed on to those accords. Despite everything they disagree on, they each saw both a national interest and a shared global interest in reaching these deals that they reached and in reinforcing the WTO. This is the way we would like it to continue to be. Another big positive to come out of MC12 was that WTO members demonstrated they could deliver collectively on problems of the global, uh, global commons. The deal they reached on cutting tens of billions of dollars of annual spending on harmful fishery subsidies will ease pressure on overexploited marine fish stocks and is the WTO's first agreement with environmental sustainability at its core. The decision exempting emergency food purchases, food aid purchases from export restrictions was a material contribution to food security at a time of rising hunger. The compromise on intellectual property for COVID-19 vac vaccines and the pledge to keep trade in medical supplies broadly open will help countries respond to this pandemic and better prepare for future health crises. Why am I saying all this? I want to make the point at the outset that the WTO is focused on delivering for people. That its purpose, written in the Marrakesh preamble, that says it's to enhance living standards, to help create employment and to support sustainable development is being lived today. This is what we want to bring back about the WTO. It is about people. Whether it's negotiating agreements, whether it's making decisions, we are dealing for people and with the problems of the day. Now, I can't afford not to take advantage that of the fact that there are foreign diplomats in attendance today. So let me take a moment to urge you, to urge your governments to deposit your instruments of acceptance of the new fisheries subsidies agreement as soon as possible. We need two thirds of the membership for the agreement to enter into force. And we are so excited that the US did so yesterday. It deposited its instrument of acceptance, joining Switzerland, Singapore, and Seychelles. And I want to reiterate my thanks to USTR Ambassador Catherine Tai and uh, to Kelly, who is here with us, the leader of the fisheries subsidies team, and the administration for this show of leadership at the WTO. It does set a good example for other large fishing nations to follow. And I, I like the joke uh, Catherine made yesterday that um, First, we had Singapore, we had Switzerland, Singapore, and Seychelles. And we thought it's only members whose uh, names begin with an S that are going to do this. So the US has broken this now by being <laughs> presenting a U for us. Now, coming back to our, our discussion, despite the achievements I was describing, we all know that the narrative around trade has been shifting. Economic interdependence and integration, which have been associated with peace and prosperity since the US and its allies set up the GATT 75 years ago, are increasingly perceived as not being so good, vices rather than virtues. The pandemic and the war in Ukraine exposed genuine vulnerabilities in global trade. All of us remember the shortages and supply bottlenecks. There is now much talk of decoupling, fragmentation and reshoring, and suggestions that supply networks should be at best limited to a handful of friends. It's important to remember that for now, the discourse and the data don't quite line up. For now, global merchandise trade reached record highs in 2021 and again in 2022. After rebounding from the lockdown, supply chains became vital means for making and accessing medical supplies and eventually vaccines. Despite the extra tariffs, goods trade between the US and China in 2022 was at an all-time record of 690 billion, according to the US Commerce Department. Trade between the EU and China was also at a record of $902 billion in 2022. Over the past year, global markets have helped countries mitigate the economic fallout from the war in Ukraine. For instance, when Ethiopia's wheat imports from Ukraine stopped, it was able to import grain from the US and Argentina. 
one in five calories consumed around the world today is traded around borders. What am I trying to say? Trade is an instrument for building resilience. But look, let me also be clear. When we look at the growth rate, the growth numbers for trade, we see a slightly more pessimistic picture. Data we released last week at the WTO showed that global merchandise trade volumes grew by only 2.7% in 2022, after a slump in the final quarter caused them to fall well short of the 3.5% growth rate we had been expecting. Second, when we look at the 2023 number of 1.7%, we see that it's below the 2.6% average growth rate for the 12 years uh, since the great financial crisis. So, whilst we, uh, there's a lot to dwell on that is positive, the outlook and the signs that we see are causes for worry. As a share of global output, trade has been slowing down for about a decade. A new World Bank study suggests that this slowdown in growth is a factor in the decline of GDP growth potential for advanced and developing countries alike. When Chad Bourne of the Peterson Institute looked under the hood of US-China trade, he found that the strong headline number I just talked about masks declines for key US manufacturing exports and for certain Chinese exports subject to high tariffs in the US market. In addition, today's trade patterns reflect yesterday's investments. And we are seeing policies and regulatory measures designed, de designed to shift investment. The IMF last week reported that foreign direct investment flows are increasingly reflecting countries' geopolitical alignment, a trend that would add up to, a substanti to substantial efficiency losses. My trip to the Hill last week, where I went with uh, Angela Ellard, with mem to engage with members of the House and Senate, especially the House Ways and Means Committee and the Senate Finance Committee, left me in no doubt that geopolitical tensions, especially US-China tensions, are worsening. And this may indeed ultimately impact the investment and trade patterns and some measure of supply chain realignment. <coughs> so some reshoring, nearshoring, and friendshoring appears inevitable. But what we are urging from the point of view of the multilateral trading system is that we need to be careful that things are not taken beyond a small number of clearly delineated areas. Otherwise, the consequences for global trade could be severe. And we are not the only ones saying this. Recent studies by the IMF and the World Bank all point in this direction. Far-reaching economic fragmentation would be incredibly costly for the world. WTO economists estimate that if the world decouples into two self-contained trading blocks, it would lower long-run global GDP by 5%, from loss of technological spillovers, economies of scale, and other factors. The opportunity cost of foregone integration that could also have uh, uh, happened at the time add another 3.7% of GDP loss. And when you look at the two together, it's massive. We could be almost talking about 9% long run global GDP loss from fragmentation. That's a bigger economic hit than, when rich country, that, than what rich countries sustained after the 2008 financial crisis. Low income countries and emerging markets would stand to see welfare losses of as much as 12% or more a devastating blow to their development prospects. In sum, fragmentation of the global trading system would hurt household purchasing power, add to the headwinds facing economic growth everywhere, and close off development opportunities for the world's poorest. And in return for all that, it could even make supply security worse because purely national supply chains would be more exposed to localized production shocks, like the US saw this last year with baby formula. We think there is a better way forward, a way we are calling 
re-globalization. The accelerated economic integration of the 30 years before the COVID-19 pandemic was not a policy mistake, as Alan Wolf, Robert Lawrence, and Gary Clyde of the PII, the Peterson Institute, described well in a recent paper. That period coincided with history's fastest reduction in extreme poverty. But many poor countries and poor people in, in rich countries did not share adequately in these gains. Re-globalization is about bringing these countries and communities from the margins to the mainstream of the global economy. Deepening, deconcentrating, and diversifying supply networks would make them more robust and resilient and less susceptible to weaponization by any single actor. Re-globalization is about extending to new geographies, a process we've already seen We've been seeing as companies broaden their supply bases in pursuit of cost savings, risk management, and proximity to markets. Bringing more small and medium-sized enterprises and women-owned businesses into these production networks would make the gains from trade more inclusive. Beyond regional partners and the China plus one syndrome, that's what I've often heard, China plus one, it's China plus Vietnam or China plus Indonesia or India. Re-globalization should encompass other countries who have not benefited as much, but who have the right business environment to welcome trade. We have Costa Rica, Morocco, South Africa, Rwanda, Bangladesh, just to name a few examples. Re-globalization must also be about harnessing changes in global trade to turn them into broadly shared benefits. So I'm talking a lot about re-globalization to this audience because I want you to leave this place, if with nothing but that one word from me. We should all be happy on this because it's a big opportunity that we have now to make good on the things that were not properly done during the time of globalization. To use this building of resilience of global supply chains to be inclusive of countries and regions within countries that did not benefit. So let me now say a, a, a few words about other aspects of trade. And I always start this by saying that I see the future of trade to be green, to be services, to be digital, and it should be inclusive, as we just uh, talked about now. You've already heard about trade and green from the panel that talked earlier, so I don't want to go too much into that issue. But I want to point out that trade is a force for rapid climate action that we need, and that nothing in WTO rules prevents members from taking climate action. Last year's World Trade Report estimates that 40% of the incredible cost decline seen for solar panels over the past 30 years was partly due to scale economies made possible in part by trade and value chains. If countries' climate policies end up giving rise to trade uncertainty and restrictions, this could end up discouraging low-carbon investment and making decarbonization slower and more expensive. That is why we've been asking governments to cooperate on a global carbon pricing framework and to be sensitive to WTO principles when implementing policies like the Inflation Reduction Act and the European Green Deal. I understand the domestic political imp imperatives, and I also understand the worry about not losing the competitive edge in certain industries. At the WTO, we certainly understand the need to create good jobs for our up-and-coming young people. But it is clear that there are ways to implement domestic policies in a manner that achieves our net zero objectives, but that minimizes negative spillover effects on other countries. There are positive ways to subsidize. What we know is that a harmful subsidy race to the bottom would ultimately serve no one and would deeply hurt poor countries who could never afford to compete. More worrying is that the global problems that we are confronting and which need strategic cooperation would become harder to solve. Failure to cooperate multilaterally on climate change will condemn our children and our grandchildren to an unlivable world. The desire to create transparency and a pathway to resolve complaints about unfair trade practices among WTO members 
has been at the heart of some new subsidy work we are doing with the IMF, the OECD, and the World Bank to identify gaps in subsidy data and rules. It's worth mentioning that all sides of this subsidy de debate, and I'm hopping on this because I talked about a bad subsidy race to the bottom, all sides of this debate have their own concerns about a level playing field based on how they see the world and how they trade. We hope that this new work that we're doing on subsidies and DDG Annabel Gonzalez and the chief economist, Ralph Osser, who is here, who are working on this, we hope this will help our members start a proper conversation, a good conversation that could ultimately lead to a relook, a reform of the way of some of our agreements, which may no longer be fit for purpose. I know this is a bold statement to make, that we could even think of reforming the subsidies and countervailing measures agreement. But we need to start somewhere. And starting somewhere is getting a good look at what is happening with subsidies today. Now, let me say a word on services, and particularly digitally delivered services, which are driving trade and growth, and which could in future become an important source of disinflationary pressure. Digitally delivered services have increased their share of total global trade from 8% in 2011 to 13% in 2021. Between 2005 to 2021, digitally delivered services grew at an average annual rate of 8.2% compared to 5% for goods. The future here is exciting. One way the WTO can help provide stability and predictability to digital trade, one of the biggest opportunities facing us, whilst lowering transaction costs for businesses of all sides, is through the ongoing negotiations on e-commerce. Nearly 90 members, including the US, China, the EU, and others, and many developing countries, are seeking to establish some basic global rules for digital trade, including practical issues such as electronic signatures and authentication, e-contracts, and online consumer protection. Another contribution the WTO can make is to resolve the issue of the multilateral moratorium against levying customs duties on cross-border electronic transmissions. Concerns of some developing countries about lost customs revenues as well as a desire to build policy space to support nascent digital industries have to be addressed. I hope that at MC13, we can come to a meaningful and hopefully permanent solution on this issue. A word now for the last part of my talk on the expectations for our 13th Ministerial Conference next February in Abu Dhabi. We have a long and exciting agenda of deliverables before the WTO, but at the same time, we have to be realistic as to what can be concretely achieved. We've touched on the e-commerce moratorium. In addition, I believe action on fisheries is possible, both to deliver the ratification that I spoke about earlier, phase one, but also to conclude the negotiations of the second phase on overcapacity and overfishing. I also believe we can take action on WTO reform. There are aspects of the reform of our monitoring, transparency, and negotiations functions that we are successfully undertaking in committees and can wrap up before or at MC13. But a top priority for all members and for business is dispute settlement reform. As part of the institutional reform program ministers launched last year, they set themselves a 2024 target for a quote, fully and well-functioning dispute settlement system accessible to all members. I'm happy to report that informal technical discussions in Geneva have moved to a new phase. The US-led process that started last summer has given one way to one led by a facilitator, Ambassador Marco Molina of Guatemala. It's very positive that members, including the US, are actively engaged in these talks. Discussions are getting more concrete, and members are looking at the full spectrum of dispute settlement approaches, rather than focusing narrowly on the appellate body. We hope that this approach will help move members to specific reform proposals, and eventually to text-based negotiations. 
While I recognize the political sensitivities around the dispute settlement system, and it's these sensitivities that give us pause sometimes about reaching a solution, the fact is that the credibility of a rules-based international order requires these rules to be enforceable. So the WTO membership really must come together to deliver on this top priority item. I believe that as long as we don't deliver a reform of the dispute settlement system, we'll continue to hear of a hobbled and non-functional WTO, even while so many aspects of the organization is, are working well. At MC13, we also have other issues that could re yield results. We know that the agriculture negotiations have been extremely difficult and are still very tough. But we are trying to see whether through a food security lens, we could get some consensus on areas that could help tackle this important global problem. There are also deliverables from emerging new plurilateral agreements, such as the investment facilitation plurilateral with 110 members. Two thirds of WTO membership set to conclude on this and deliver at MC13. Finally, we are working on delivering a couple of new accessions out of the 22 countries in the queue. We cannot do all of this work unless we have your support. And that is why I'm here today at WITA. You are the people in the field. You know what goes on. You can influence the membership. You can talk to Congress. You can help us move the agenda of the WTO. The WTO is moving. It is not the WTO of last year. It's a new WTO that is now delivering results and building more trust among the membership than certainly I found when I was there two years ago. What does all this mean? It means that we are capable of delivering more for trade. And we need you to be our ambassadors to be able to do this. I hope I can count on every single one of you, WITA members, to take our issues forward in a positive way and help us continue to get results. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Um, that was a great uh, set of remarks, Dr. Ngozi, and you covered a lot. Um, but before getting back to trade, um, I wanted to ask you some questions about you. You're such an incredible inspiration to so many of us, so many people in the community. Um, you know, as Ken said in his introduction, you're the first woman, the first African, the first African woman in so many um, of the positions that you've had throughout your career. You've been a, a fearless advocate for gender equity. Um, you know, you wrote a book on women in leadership. I saw an interesting um, comment that your sister made um, when, uh, about your dad um, when you became director general. And, and she said that your dad raised you to believe that what a man can do, a woman can do better. I'd love to hear how growing up in Nigeria, um, how did this attitude shape your ambitions and how did, did it lead you to where you are today? Well, thank you so much, Demetrius. And it's a pleasure to, to, to be here. And I'm also the first American to head the WTO. <laughs> so, um, well, um, I think my, my growing up and my environment really shaped me in a, a decisive way, which is that when I was young, about a year old, my parents left me with my grandmother uh, because they got scholarships as poor students to go and study in Germany. Uh, this was after the war. And uh, so they couldn't afford to take me. And my grandmother raised me for almost nine years before they came back. Um, with a sense of, uh, and this was in the village, commitment to community. Um, so I was brought up to believe that it's not about yourself. It's about uh, your community and those around you, whatever you do. And this, uh, so growing up, I did everything. By the time I was eight, I, I knew how to cook. Uh, my grandmother was very loving, but we also 
very focused <laughs> on getting your life skills. When my parents came back, uh, this kind of sense continued that education is not for you. It's not about you. It's about giving back to the community. So that has shaped the way I view the world and the careers I've pursued. It's always for me being about how do I get uh, a, a, an instrument that can help do good for the greater number of people, whether it's in government as a, a minister, whether it was a, as a, at the World Bank as a young economist. What I was doing was working on agriculture and urban areas, trying to help poor people all over the world. And that has brought me to the WTO with the same mission. When I saw the purpose of the WTO that I talked to you about earlier, that's really what attracted me. And that's what puzzles me. Why does the organization and trade have this image? Something has gone awry somewhere when you're set up to be about people, and yet people think you're anti-people. I'll come back to that, Dr. Ngozi, because I think that's a, a really critical point. Um, one other element of your career that, that I find so admirable um, was your determination and dedication to stamp out corruption in the oil industry um, in Nigeria. And I've heard that it earned you a, a nickname that means a troublesome, tough woman, which <laughs> is a, a, a moniker that I hear that you loved. But of course, going back to um, Nigeria in both 2003 and 2011, required some real personal sacrifices on your part and, and forced you to confront some real uh, security risks. How did you weigh these decisions um, or these factors in your decisions to go back home? Well, thank you. You know, I'd always uh, thought that if there is a way I could use my skills that I'd acquired as a development economist at the World Bank to help Nigeria or Africa as a whole, I would, I would do that. And so, um, you know, looking for opportunities, the first one came in 2000 when I was asked to come back and be an advisor to the then president. He heard I knew how to deal with debt issues and Nigeria's debt was all over the place. Uh, instead of being managed by seven agencies, nobody knew the total number or the debt service. You know, things were really not uh, in order. And so he asked me to come and I put that together, put everything. He told me my dream is to press a button and get the numbers. And how much do we owe? What's the debt service this month and to whom? And we did all of that, introducing the software, built the debt management office, which is still there today. And that led to my being asked to come back and be finance minister. But focusing, as you said, on particular reforms. So when I, I went there, uh, it wasn't easy. I'll actually tell you a little joke about how I became finance minister. I was sitting in my office at the World Bank, and the president of the bank then was Jim Wolfenson. Uh, God bless his soul. And, and my office was near his. So it was afternoon, and he breezed into my office. And, uh, you know, the president walks into your office, and you're wondering what went wrong now. You know, whatever. And so he walks into my office and says, oh, you're going to be finance minister of Nigeria. And I said, Jim, really? <laughs> and he said, yes, I just told your president you'll become, it's okay, you can go. And I looked at him, I said, this must be a joke. And he looked at me and said, it's true. I said, Jim, we have a child in college, another one about to join. I'm not sure this is the right time. So it was, that was my first thought, because uh, and he said, well, I've already promised him that you're coming. <laughs> so that's how I found out. And I, I called my president later and said, how could you? You didn't even ask me. You asked my boss. Um, but the point is, it was a huge opportunity to try to do some reforms, to try to get our $30 billion in debt written off by the Paris Club, to try to find ways to, uh, you know, stamp, help to mitigate, stamp out corruption, to build institutions that would endure on, in the financial sector. So all of these, I had the opportunity, and what a privilege. It was very tough. You mentioned my name, Okonja Wahala, you know, people gave me that name because they thought I, I was too troublesome. And you know, it was tough. When you're trying to stamp out corruption, the corrupt people turn around and accuse you of corruption. Mm. And then you find yourself fighting for your own name. All that happened to me. They, my mother was kidnapped, which, you know, everybody knows that story. 
so many things happened, but at the end of the day, it is, was one of the biggest privileges of my life to be able to use the policy levers, the budget instrument in the hands of a finance minister to change the direction of a country. You've written um, about leadership, and one of the, you know, obviously your key roles is, is leading to bring members of the WTO together. You had mentioned in your remarks, you know, the, the challenge of today's geopolitical environment. How do you do that? Um, how do you bring members together when geopolitics are, are the way they are today? Very tough. I mean, the one thing at the WTO that is very difficult is a trust deficit. There's a big trust deficit among members. It was the biggest observation I made when I came, and that explains to me why the ability to make more multilateral agreements has been so uh, lacking. You know, it's been so difficult, and um, so and then that's height worsened by the geopolitical tensions that we see now. It's something we live every day, and I have senior members of my team here. They can tell you that when we wake up every day, we're expecting to, to deal with an issue. Either the EU has some issue that has happened with China or some other country, or the US or, or Russia, Ukraine, and so on. It's a constant tug, and it comes in the, or Taiwan and China, Chinese Taipei and China. Uh, Ch Taiwan is known as Chinese Taipei at the WTO. Uh, so Chinese Taipei and China, there are constant tensions in almost everything we do. Um, but how do we bring people together? I believe that bringing together is not, you can't talk people into it. You actually have to get them achieving something together. And uh, the fact that at the WTO, in spite of these tensions, I'm really proud of my members. I mean, when we delivered the, 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 some of the successes, successes of MC12. The US was there and uh, helped to make it happen. China was there, Ukraine and Russia were there. So everybody built that success. And that's the way you bring them together. That's the way you try to minimize the distrust and deal a little bit with the tension by saying to members, they have to be one or two places in this world, a multilateral organization or space where you work together because you need to talk to each other somewhere. And why not at the WTO? Mm -hmm. So that's a value proposition that I put forward. We are a space where you can show that multilateralism, even if you don't like each other, you can still cooperate on certain things and give hope to the young people of this world. Taking that to your, the comment you made earlier, and, and something that I, I do think is important, um, and, and important that you always stress is the fact that the WTO is for the people. Um, and you know, you you cited the parts of the Marrakesh Protocol, um, you know, that really emphasizes that. Um, how do you make trade resonate for people? There's always, I mean, the challenge in every political system is there's the sort of view that trade is not good for the people because of, of you know, this, that, or the other thing. Um, but if you want to make trade the WTO for the people, how do you make the people invested in the progress in the WTO? I think you have to do it by explaining what is happening in language that people can understand and, and relate to, and by showing them it's really delivering. So it's not by talk. Let's just take the fisheries subsidies agreement. You have to explain to people that 260 million people in the world depend on fisheries for livelihood. You have to explain to them that our, our oceans are 40% plus overfished. You have to explain to them that actually some of the subsidies that people, some countries are giving to build big vessels and nets that drag everything off the ocean floor are harming those fisheries. And then you go from there to say, this is the livelihood of many people, including in the US, in Washington state and other states, people are fishers. If we continue to allow these subsidies to, to, to go on, for us to have these huge industrial vessels dragging the floor, fishing illegally off the high seas, what happens is that over time there's less 
for you to build your livelihood on. And that is why this agreement matters for you. It's not some big word. We can bring and boil it down to who you are and what you do. And that's the kind of explanation that we need to do. We don't talk of fishery subsidies agreement. It's very meaningless. I have to be able in my village to explain to people what I do because they don't understand what, what is this WTO and what does it mean? So it is bringing every agreement. When you talk about the agreement decision that members took not to put export restrictions on World Food Program humanitarian purchases, you have to tell people, even in America, who are very generous and supportive, that look, 350 million people are food insecure and they depend on the World Food Program, which is largely financed by the US, to, to survive. And if we put restrictions, if a, if a member says, listen, you can buy food from me because I'm, even though I have enough, I'm trying to hoard it for my population just in case, then they won't be able to feed other people and those people will not live. They will die or they'll live where they are, end up on your shores, right? So you explain it to them in those terms. And that is how you bring it down to people. So that's what I'm trying to do. And uh, we, our senior management team, is trying to do the same thing. Now, some of the things are a little bit difficult. You know, when you try to talk of technical barriers to trade or sanitary and phytosanitary. Well, sanitary and phytosanitary requirements are actually quite easy because they prevent people from selling their agricultural or other products. So that's what it is. Bring it down to the basics. One um, other area that I'd, I'd love to pick your brain on is, is the, the role of small businesses in international trade and, and how the WTO can be relevant to small businesses, particularly women-owned micro and small businesses. I, I think you had cited a study, Dr. Ngozi, that said that um, women who trade earn almost three times as much as, as women who don't, who stay in their domestic economies. How do we make the WTO more relevant to small businesses, particularly women-owned small businesses? Yeah, this was a study done by the WTO and uh, the World Bank that women who, who sell externally and double uh, the, the income of those who sell in the, in the domestic uh, market. So that, that just sets the scene for asking how can you bring women more international, regional, and global value chains? Because they, they, for so many reasons, they don't have access. So at the WTO, there are two things I see for SMEs and women-owned SMEs. One is how to build gender issues and mainstream them into agreements in a way that will make sure women have equal opportunity and are seen, uh, have equal opportunity within these agreements. But the second is, supply side constraints that you're talking about, how do we deal with those? And at the WTO and at the ITC, the International Trade Center, which is 50% owned by WTO and 50% by UNCTAD, we can actually deal directly with supply side issues. And uh, so dealing with issues that women uh, face, such as access to information and to markets, um, access to uh, advice about quality, of their product, many you will be amazed. Many of the women SMEs I've talked to, the one thing they're always asking is, how do I raise the quality of my product so I can enter that international market? Uh, whether it's cosmetics, we were just with women in Colombia, on the Pacific coast of Colombia, which has uh, um, the, you know, a lot of uh, people in the black population, and a woman was making cosmetics for people of darker skin, and she wants to break into the US market. She's already selling in Colombia. She wants advice from the WT. I'm just using her as an example of share butter producers in Ghana and Nigeria. So giving them that kind of advice, helping them building capacity so that they can meet those quality standards and the SPS standards, th this is very important. Those are an access to trade finance or credit which is a perpetual problem that many of them, especially women, face, we can give advice on that. So breaking the supply side barriers is a big thing for me. And that is how we can help more women. We are helping. I think what we need to do is scale it up and talk about it more. People can actually see what it is we're having as impact on the ground. 
Um, I'm going to ask one more question and then open it up to the audience. I was very heartened um, by your comments that you're starting to see progress um, in uh, WTO reform issues, particularly dispute settlement reform. As you travel the world and, and are in different capitals, are you sensing a change in view towards the WTO and towards um, you know, the importance of making the changes to make the institution work better? Well, let, I, I would say um, yes, but boy, we have a long way to go. Mm. Um, I think on the Hill last two weeks ago, I was with Angela. There were some who did not know about the WTO, some new members, and were not really, maybe not as interested. They are more focused on domestic issues. There were some who knew about the WTO, but knew the wrong, had the wrong image. And then there were some who knew and were very supportive. But I'll tell you one thing. Even those who did not know and were more focused on domestic, what struck me was their willingness to listen to us and to, to give us the space and the time because you can't co correct anything, you can't build consensus, you can't change minds if people won't even listen to you. And I'm so grateful that on the Hill, there was listening. I was actually surprised when, you know, to see how... how interested, finally they became in hearing and debating back and forth and asking questions. So I think it will take a lot of doing. Uh, there are many people, especially young people, who feel this is organization is not for us, it's actually uh, against us. Uh, even when I was taking the job, one of my sons said, how can you do this? And I had to explain to him why I was going there and show him this uh, Marrakesh preamble. And then he said, well, if you can achieve things that will help, actually help people. So we must continue to communicate. There are so many things. I was just at AU this morning, and one of the professors pointed out the very good work that goes on in committees that nobody talks about. The works on standards, the conversations. This is a place where members come together in committees to iron out issues. There's no other place in the world. If we didn't have it, what would happen? There'll be so many issues out there and we'll be paralyzed. So uh, we need to communicate those things better. I sense among leaders, I sense more support. Mm. I mean, among the presidents and prime ministers, I'm certainly feeling it when I go to these meetings. Among ministers, you know, and uh, eventually among ordinary people, whenever we speak, I think we're changing a bit. But you can help, you have to amplify our voice. There is no way just uh, myself and the senior members, I'm really counting on you as the trade community to help us do it. Let's open up the floor to questions. If we can, let's take like two or three real quick and then we can wrap up, okay? Yeah, there's one over here and then over here and then in the back. If you can keep your question short and to the point, it would be great. Please write back here. Good afternoon. I'm Barbara Simmons, Vice Chair of the International Law Section of the National Bar Association. And thank you, Dr. Ngozi. I was so proud the day I learned that you had been appointed. Um, this term, uh, reglobalization, thank you for that. I'd never heard that before. Uh, also, it wasn't until you today and earlier this morning when M Ambassador Tai referred to uh, trade as an issue for people. Thank you for that. My question is, can you uh, talk more about reglobalization in relationship to the AFCFTA, the African Continental Free Trade Area? Let's take one other one over here, right up front. Hello, Dr. Gozi. Hi, Carol. So nice to see you in Washington. Uh, um, it, my name's Carol Pinot. I'm a journalist, <laughs> I as know. you know. <laughs> Dr. Ngozi was in one of my films, was the, the star of it. So, um, Dr. Ngozi, one of the things that is so important for Africa to be part of global supply chains is energy security. And we heard a lot earlier about climate, but Africa, of course, has the lowest emissions, and yet what they really need is an energy mix in order to be able to industrialize. Mm -hmm. 
the developing world is often saying, no, we're not going to finance anything with oil and gas. So how do you see that for being able to be part of the global supply chains, the financing for energy security? You said the third one? Oh, this is it? OK. Thank you so much on re-globalization. We're really trying to, to you know, get behind and push this concept. Um, and uh, this is a concept that we've developed at the WTO. Uh, and what we're trying to say in relationship to the African continental free trade area. Africa is share of, the, of global trade is slightly less than 3%. Africa's share of trade, among, uh, intra-African trade, is about 18 to 20 percent. Africa cannot increase its position and share unless it adds more value to its products. We cannot continue exporting just raw materials and commodities. We need to add value. And I'll say it again. I've said it many times elsewhere. Why should Africa import 90 5% of 90% uh, of its pharmaceuticals, a whole continent of 1.4 billion, and 90, 99% of vaccines, 90% of pharmaceuticals. We've seen that that is not resilience in given what we saw during the pandemic. So this is one area where the continent, within the context of the continental free trade area, should be asking ourselves itself. How do we work with the global pharmaceutical industry so we can build some supply chains within the continent, the market is big enough to supply ourselves and maybe even outside? So that's how it relates. Now that we have this free trade agreement, you can move goods more easily. Eventually, we still have an infrastructure problem, by the way, connecting one part of one country to the other in Africa sometimes costs more Sending goods from one country to the other can be more costly than bringing them from China or from Europe or somewhere. So, but this re-globalization means we can ask some global supply chains, work with them if they want to build resilience to locate on the continent. Bringing those countries that were not part of the globalization last time into the framework, integrating them. And at the same time, building resilience for the world. So Senegal, Rwanda, South Africa, Nigeria, you know, those countries, Ghana, where there is the appetite, we can do that. So that's how I would relate the two, to help build internal market, but also build external connectivity to the outside world, and then we can sell more. Um, on the issue of energy security, this is a very, very big question. And uh, the way I would answer, the, the, uh, answer it is this. You're right, Africa is less than 3% of global, total global carbon emissions. So it emits very little, but it's paying a lot of the consequences. 69% um, of all debt, so is it 66%? is occurring in countries that have the zero to the lowest emissions in the world. Just think about that. So you, we need to find ways to guarantee them uh, energy security. How do we do this and still work towards net zero by 2050? In other words, you know, Africa is not exempt from the Paris Club agreements, but how do we do it? We need a transition period. And the whole world needs to agree to it. And we need a transition fuel. And we, that transition fuel should be gas, not coal, as some countries depend totally on coal, not oil, but gas. And the continent has enough gas. So I think the rest of the world needs to understand that for base power, base load for manufacturing and others, we need to have this to be able to electrify and assure energy security to the continent. At the same time, we pursue a parallel program of increasing the amount of renewable energy that we have. So the two can go hand in hand during this transition period. And that is what the Africans need to embed and argue for, both with civil society that is saying don't invest in anything gas, 
as well as uh, business and uh, with governments outside. Let me end by saying, look, we've seen what happened in Europe and how Europe has turned back to use of even coal, in some cases temporarily, and to gas. So if this can happen, and if they are even in the United States, I mean, I think if you ask, let's say, Senator Manchin, he would argue that the U.S. still needs a transition period with some kind of fossil fuel. So there are places, even in developed countries, where this is being argued. Can you imagine a continent where 55% of households do not have access to electricity, saying that they cannot have a transition period with gas? I think that's not workable. Dr. Ngozi, Demetrius, we are incredibly grateful to you for joining us today. I want to also uh, call out um, Annabelle Gonzalez, who's here with us today, as well as, of course, Angela Ellard, who's on our panel. Thank you both for joining us today. Thanks to our first panel. Thanks to all of you. Dr. Ngozi Okonjiwela, it is an honor and a pleasure to have had, had you back on the WIDA stage. We are a microphone for you. Uh, we are our community of trade professionals can bring this message to the world and uh, to the extent that we can be helpful in spreading uh, your gospel of trade, uh, please look to us. Our Trade on the Hill series is also continuing and we are working to educate new members of Congress about trade, so we're also taking the message there as well. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Dr. Okonje Wela. Thank you, Demetrius. Uh, grateful to both of you. Thank you everybody for joining us. Take care and uh, be well. Thank you. Thank you.